the pantomime. It's a wonderful and marvellous, if slightly eccentric, British institution performed in great theatres such as this one or in small village halls up and down the country. And almost always based upon favourite children's stories like Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Babes in the Wood or even Aladdin. And whether it's a lavish performance or an amateur dramatic production, we all love a panto. And in the end of each one, the villain is defeated, love conquers all, and they all live happily ever after. So how did this curious British institution come about? Pantomime literally means all kinds of mime, panto mime. It's generally acknowledged that the origins lie within the 16th century Italian theatrical form of Commedia dell'arte, troops of professional actors working from a synopsis of a story, not a complete script, with improvised situations and dialogue, and characters with names such as Harlequin, Columbine, Pantaloon and Archelino. By the time it crossed from Europe and developed in England in the mid-18th century, the shows involved scenes from classical mythology and fairy tales and children's stories. The first poster advertising a pantomime at the Theatre Royal in Norwich is dated May 1774. It was called Venus's Frolics, or Harlequin Animated, and it was part of a wider variety night involving a play, in this instance called Love in a Village, performed by His Majesty's Servants. This format became quite standard for many decades. First the play, then a dance, possibly some music, and then the pantomime. And it all began at quarter past six o'clock. In 1798, Robinson Crusoe makes an appearance, not with Man Friday, but Harlequin Friday, referencing the character from the Commedia dell'arte troops. Still part of the performance, but dwindling popularity and a shift to the children's stories meant that he rarely appeared by the 1860s. In 1849, the production of Aladdin took place in April, not around Christmas, and it's billed as a splendid burlesque spectacle. And you have to sit through Othello and a Scottish dance before Aladdin arrives on stage. Note also that his mother is referred to as Widow Mustafa, her original name when the story was first written. It was not until 1861 that she became Widow Twanky, a reference to the most popular Chinese tea drunk in England at the time, perhaps the first sign of product placement. Certainly in the early part of the 19th century, the evening's entertainment was performed by stock company of the day, which would be regarded as an in-house company today. It would start with a play, maybe followed by a song or dance by an individual, and then the pantomime at the end. They had juvenile evenings, when the pantomime would precede the rest of the evening entertainment, so that families could then leave with the younger children. Aren't you a gorgeous looking bunch? Oh, you're lovely. Oh, you're lovely. You're lovely. <laughs> yeah. Towards the final decades of the 19th century, the shape of the pantomime as we know it today began to emerge. It became the norm for a principal boy to be played by an actress, for a dame to be played by an actor. It became a mixture of seemingly unmixable elements. Romance, slapstick, topical songs, dancers, acrobatics and audience participation. By the start of the 20th century, the variety nights of drama, music, dance and panto were developing into the pantomime standing alone as a single show. In the early part of the, the 20th century, the pantomimes had come to resemble the, the pantomime that you might see today. Dick Whittington, Cinderella, Aladdin. We often hear of people talking about the traditional pantomime, but to remain popular and bring in revenue, producers have to keep an eye firmly on modern trends. People love the pantomime, so we always make sure it's a really traditional story. That's very important. But at the same time, we really want it to be modern and appealing to all ages. And um, so therefore, we have lots of elements that are very modern. So our lovely teenagers that are coming really can relate to it. So we've had fairy Twitter in the past, and um, we've had a Facebook page, and all sorts of wonderful things that we do. And also the music is really important. We wait every summer to hear what the big hit is. Um, so it's really important that those modern elements are interspersed with the traditional story. Sometimes we have adults and it's the first time they've ever set foot in a theatre and it's because they've been dragged down to come and see them pant. A little bit shuffly and not too happy, rather be down the pub or watching the football. But once we get them on side, 
then it really does start to enthuse people's joy of live entertainment. And there's no better way to introduce than a fun, laid back way, which is Panda. And what we try and do here is make it, we, we're not too pretentious, we're not too smart, we're not too clever, but we're fun. Well, the Panda plays two really important roles. The first is that financially, it underpins the whole of the rest of the year. If the pantomime fails, the rest of the year is struggling. Uh, but the second, um, perhaps more important fact about the pantomime is that it's the only performing art form which at its best appeals to absolutely everybody. All ages, all strata of society. You know, it's a great big communal knees up. Many of the pantos at our local theatres are in-house productions. They're a vital element to the theatre's annual programme and its annual budget. So it's essential that they put on a show worthy of us digging deep into our pockets and buying the tickets. So what are the main elements of a successful panto? A strong storyline well told, good versus evil, song and dance, comedy, children, animals, add in some glorious costumes and bright scenery. Well, it all sounds simple, but it's not. I asked some of the producers what they felt were the main elements. The magic of the pantomime would be the traditional elements of it, where the children, even when they come out of the womb, <laughs> know some, somehow how to say, oh no he isn't, oh yes, he, oh, yes it is. I, I don't know how, but they just automatically know. They're not necessarily taught it, but they sit in a theatre and they know straight away. They know he's behind you. They know that it's not real, but they see these characters. But the great thing is they can join in. And hard for us as performers because you never know what you're going to get thrown at you. Everybody obviously wants to see a little bit of romance, a little bit of um, tension with, with some of the baddies. So that's obviously a, a, something that we're trying to create and make sure that there's enough spark and um, dynamic there on stage. That's obviously one side. People want to see a little bit of dance. So it's important to get the right choreographer in to then create that. From writing a panto early on in the year, you might find, as you say, some topics that happen early on in the year. Are they still going to be relevant come December? Probably not. So you tend to wait until October, November time before you start putting in topical stuff. You can't put anything in that people won't remember. So possibly there'll be something in there about the American elections. But I think going back any further than that, people have got short memories on news topics. So, and it's finding relevant jokes that will fit. Let's start with the script. It needs to be good, it needs to be strong, it needs to be funny. Uh, it needs to appeal to the traditional uh, that people expect, while introducing some new elements. Because the point about pantomime for the last 150 years is that it's responded to what's around. You know, it's changed the songs, it's changed the jokes, it's appealed more to television, it's put in television stars. It's, it, it's changed, and it changes every single year. So what we look for is a strong story with traditional elements, but which can be updated. So I think the elements are joining in, the music is great, the costumes and the scenery have to be bright and exciting. It doesn't have to be hugely expensive. The story is important, but not as important as you think it is, because if you look at some of the stories, they're rather silly stories anyway. But all those elements of, of the thrill of going into the theatre and that magic when you go in, and you know, this lighting and, and you, know, we, we, you know, we have sort of flashing lights and, and, and all that sort of thing. And it's just, a, it's just a lovely, exciting production. And I think for children, they want to go in and they go, <gasps> The pantomime dame, usually the hero's mother, such as Widow Twanky in Aladdin or Dame Trot in Jack and the Beanstalk, was a creation that emerged from the early musicals of the Victorian era. The public warmed to see their favourite comedians playing Jack's mother or the King's cook and bottle washer. And the actor who pioneered the art of cross-dressing was one of the most famous pantomime clowns of all, Joseph Grimaldi, who made his first appearance in 1800. 
Such was the eminence of Grimaldi that to this day clowns are called joeys. His influence on these early pantomimes was immense, the public clamouring to see his performances and leaving the London theatre singing the comic choruses of the songs he introduced. Pantomime had its first real star, and by this time the element of comedy songs and slapstick were firmly rooted as they have remained to this present day. Music hall idol Dan Leno was another actor whose dame creations drew large crowds. In 1904, the role of Mother Goose was created for him, and once again he injected the stage business and comic songs that have become an essential element, along with the use of well-known actors, singers and personalities in modern-day pantomime. There are two different kinds of talent that you require in a pantomime. One is the talent that actually holds the core of the story together. The principal boy, the principal girl, they, they, they tell the plot. That's one kind of talent because they need to be good, they need to be real, they need to have nice voices, they need to be attractive personalities, but essentially they're inside the plot. Then you need, for the dame, for the ugly sisters, for the comic, you need people who can turn to the audience and improvise. And that's a different kind of talent, somebody who has got an immediate connection with the audience, as well as being able to snap straight back into the, into the pictures. <laughs> do excuse me. Now, which way do I go? Are you lost? No! Are you looking for a friend? No, I'm just searching! Oh! I can show you some sights. You have what we call straight roles, which is your principal boys, uh, your princess type roles. Then you have your more comic roles, which may be more your dame, your comic, possibly characters like the, the Baron or the Friar. They need to have something extra about them. Now, your straight characters almost are in that world, and they accept that world as reality, and they carry the plot forward along. What your comics have got to be able to do is not only be able to deliver the comedy right, because there's no point just saying a joke, because it's an instinctive way of being able to deliver a line get that punch, but also you've got to be able to think on your feet. There's no two ways about it. If you're unable to either deal with something happening on the audience or on stage, because when you do 29 shows, 30 shows, something's going to go wrong, and you've got to be able to fill that. So it's an, it's an energy, it's a twinkle in the eye. Thanks, guys, that's great. Where's she? Where are you? Oh, here comes Mum. I'll see you later. Bye! <laughs> I love it because I can be completely different when I'm on stage. You can be completely over the top. When I play Dame, I always play it very clearly as it's obviously a bloke in a dress sort of thing. And I just enjoy the humour of it. You can get away with a bit more being a Dame for the adults that the children understand, but you can also have a laugh and a good joke with the children as well. It's a fun part. You can be a little bit naughty with people and have a little go at some of the other characters, yet the audience still really like you because you're the dame, so you're funny, so you can get away with it. So you can, you can say things that maybe if a baddie said, people would boo, but if you say as a dame, people will laugh. The element of principal boy, played by a girl, is on the decline today, though it's a tradition dating back to the early 1800s. In the rise of the Victorian musical, it became the rule, and indeed right the way through the First and Second World Wars, it held sway. And there have been occasions in the 1970s and 80s at the Norwich Theatre Royal, including pantomime director Yvonne Marsh as Dick Whittington in 1976, and as recently as 2007 with actress Nicky Adams in the same role. Sarah Pride is back at Goulston Pavilion this season and is preparing for a different role to those of past years. She's playing Aladdin. <laughs> This is the first time I've played Principal Boy and I have played many different characters before. My preparation only really started when I actually went into my costumes and they have actually made me feel more like Principal Boy. Show me your hand. Nothing. The other hand. Told you. Show me both hands. Oh, Aladdin! We don't rehearse until about a week before we actually go on. You, you kind of, you're learning the lines, but you keep it relatively empty because that only really happens when you start working with your other actors and obviously what the director wants as his interpretation.
Of the many elements that make up this annual feast of fun and frivolity, along with a chance to shout, he's behind you, is an opportunity to step into the extraordinary mind of the teams that design the wonderful costumes that we see on the stage. And of course, there's been so many, the leading ladies and gentlemen, the good fairy, the evil villain. There's the boys and girls of the chorus. And of course, the dames and the ugly sisters. <laughs> From Cinderella and Aladdin to Dick Whittington, Peter Pan, Babes in the Wood and Jack in the Beanstalk, the creative brains that are entrusted to produce the colourful and occasionally outrageous designs that we've all admired have delivered year on year. One of the big things, particularly for children, this is their probably first experience of a theatre, and the colours um, coming out and the costumes, because the costumes have got to tell the story as well. I mean, it would be no good doing sort of a three... Goldilocks and the Three Bear type clothes for Aladdin, and nor would Aladdin sit well in Little Red Riding Hood. So you've got to follow the theme, and I think you've got to overemphasize the theme. I trained in the fashion business, and it's only the last sort of four or five years that I've really got heavily into this business. And the different colours look right on stage, and you know, um, Des Barrett, who directs it, will say, no, you, you should use this with, with that colour, and I'll think, no, we can't put those two together. I'm afraid he's always right, but then he's had years of experience on the stage. And they do work, and the colours do look good together. What really helped me to begin to get to Hook is when you start to, to, to dress up as Hook, because you get the wig, and you have the big frock coat, and you have the boots, and the frilly shirt, uh, and the moustache, and then you have the hook. And when you get all of that on, all of a sudden you do physically change. And I come from quite a physical practice, so all of a sudden you are physically finding out how it is to be dressed as this person. So that's, that starts. And how you operate with only one hand and a hook which is rubber and doesn't <laughs> stay where you think it's going to be and you find that you're pointing it all in the wrong places. So that starts, that starts to get you in there and almost going to do things and forgetting you've got it. You know, and you're poking yourself in the eye and fortunately it's rubber. So, so yeah, th th things like that and just, just knowing that you've always got to hold it all the time. You have so many costumes and they're so outlandish and for me the more outlandish the better and the ones I, I enjoy more are because I'm a big person I love the ones that take the mickey out of being a big person so I'm a big bra on and if I have some tight tops and like little short skirts that always causes a laugh and if you have anything where you have a big chest and a big bum the audience just laugh as soon as you walk on so that's always great last year I was Sarah the cook so Mike had made me a lovely costume where I had like a frying pan on with eggs and tomatoes and sausages. But I think my favourite one was during like the Dalmatians, when that came up, 101 Dalmatians, 102 Dalmatians. I had a Dalmatian costume again that Mike had made, which was literally in the Dalmatian, looked like Dalmatian fur, and I actually had a Dalmatian on my hat, on the head. And that was a, a great one, that was. I've had several mishaps with costumes. The worst was when I was playing Cinderella at Western Supermare, which was probably in the 70s or early 80s. And I had a, I was Cinderella, and Cinderella wears a hoop under a big dress when she's at the ball and, and midnight is about to strike. But they, because it's cheap in pantomime, the hoop didn't have any material in between the rungs. So um, we're waltzing with the stroke of midnight going dong, dong, dong. I had he high heels on and as I went to dance like this, I got my heel caught in one of the hoops. In the story, what happens with Cinderella, you have to leave the glittery slipper on the steps for the prince to find her later on. But I have to be up there by that midnight because a girl dressed up in me rags has to run on while I run off. In other words, magically, I've gone back into me rags. I thought, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So anyway, I had to hop up the back of the stage with this crinoline going like this to the stroke of midnight. I hopped off and I got to about midnight and I thought I haven't left my shoe on the stage because it's stuck here. So I threw it on <laughs> and the girl dressed in rags came on and sort of ran across. And it was just awful, awful moment. Our 
ask any actor that's worked with animals and children and they'll confirm the saying that's attributed to the great American comedian W.C. Fields who offered, never work with animals and children. <laughs> it's an old showbiz adage. They're a little bit unpredictable. They can steal the scene. You're never quite too sure what they're going to say next. Well, I guess every actor has had his or her experience. But if you do choose to do panto, then there's every chance you're going to be working with children or animals. After all, pantos are primarily aimed at the younger audiences and are nearly always based on well-known children's stories. Children are an important element of the show, whether it be the Lost Boys in Aladdin or as villagers and chorus in just about every other pantomime. So what memory do the actors in this year's pantos in Norfolk have of working with children and animals? Children are usually great. We have had odd moments when they've forgotten to come on, but generally uh, they're very well rehearsed and very, very well behaved, on stage that is, not necessarily off stage, but we have had trouble with animals. We did um, Wizard of Oz, and in the Wizard of Oz, if you know the story, there's Toto, Toto the dog. And we said, we're gonna have a real dog in this. We did find um, a sweet little dog that was a, um, a, te a terrier and um, a dear, dear, dear little thing, very well behaved, but bearing in mind this dog had to do 42 performances. It, we thought, my goodness, this is amazing, this dog's fantastic. Started off all right, but then plainly got a bit fed up, and also something spooked it one night. And Dorothy sings Somewhere Over the Rainbow with this dog on, on her knee, and it had been great up to about the first week, first couple of weeks, lovely. The dog just sat there looking like this, everyone was going, ah, ah. But then something spooked it, and all of a sudden it started howling. Every time she sang, somewhere over the rainbow, which of course was absolutely hilarious for the, uh, the audience, for this moving moment, you know, where she's tears. And because she just had to carry on while the dog, arr, arr, arr. And kids love watching kids. So you see kids in the audience all of a sudden light up. And say, well, there's, 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 look, I, I could do that. Why, why can I do that, Mum? Can I do that? And the mum says, yes or no. Depends if they can dance or not or sing. They're part of the Panto family that, that comes back every year to us. And last year we had a, a fantastic. Sometimes we give them the odd line, the odd joke to do. And last year was a, was a cracking one in the uh, in the ballroom scene. Buttons is over the prince. He needs a quick distraction. And this one of the little girls was walking on dressed as a paper boy, and says. Extra, extra, and Button says, oh, I have one of those, cheers, mate. And he tells a Chelsea joke, or it was a football joke in the paper, like that, closes it, and then the little, the little newspaper girl goes, extra, extra, I'm only an extra, and then just walks straight off to tremendous laughter, probably more laughter than we got all the way through it. Um, so, yeah, no, they're, they're great to have. A classic example of s stealing a seat. Yeah, yeah, and we let them do it, why not? Only once, though, only once, mind you. <laughs> One year we got a bit carried away, we were doing Aladdin and we talked about Alibaba and the 40 Thieves and we ended up with quite a few children and we really struggled with where to put them because the theatre is little. So we actually managed to put them under the rake where the seating is as a nice cupboard and we put them there and we thought actually this is working really well, they're being very quiet, we don't have to worry about them. When I went to call them, I found out that actually that's also where we keep the ice creams and the little monkeys had been eating all the ice creams. So not the best place to keep them. We also had, when I did Cinderella, a beautiful production where in the closing scene is Cinderella goes into the coach, she's got the horses and she's got, you know, the rats have turned into horses and it was all white, beautifully white. I think this was Western Superman. So we're all there, everybody's dressed in white and they had real horses, the ponies actually, white ponies, oh lovely. Came on stage and there we are, this moving moment, you know, with Cinderella, you're off to the ball. And as she turned round, both the horses decided to go to the toilet on the stage. All this white with just two steaming piles of brown. So there we have it, a history of pantomime. Just a small glimpse into the many elements that make up one of our favourite nights at the theatre. I hope you'll have an opportunity to go and see one of the wonderful pantomimes that's in Norfolk this season. And if you do, I hope the children and the animals all behave. But you know, sometimes it's the adults you've got to be wary of. <laughs> <laughs>
Merry Christmas.